Hey, Josh Lindorf and Ethan Peterson. Welcome to the Take Bootcamp Podcast. Hey, thanks for having us. Good to meet you. Yeah, hey, we're excited to be on. Yeah, no, it's really cool. You guys have finally uh, been able to join us. I mean, you guys uh, sort of lit the Lyme world on fire when you were profiled in uh, in the newsletter for LymeDisease.org. So talk to us about um, how you guys got on the uh, Lyme community's radar and why the My, uh, My Lyme data um, project was so important to the two of you so that you would do some uh, fundraising and awareness for that uh, for that program. Yeah, so we saw the trailer for the quiet epidemic um, last February or January. We were like, wow, this is going to be an awesome documentary. And so I reached out to the producers and I was like, we'd love to show this to our families. Is there any way and our friends could we, you know, get a copy or is it coming out in, in theaters? Like, well, you can host a screening. And so we basically just jumped right in after that yeah. and we booked a theater and we just invited everyone that we knew. <laughs> yeah, initially it was like, hey, let's let's just raise awareness for people close to us because people don't understand always what, what we're going through. Um, but then it turned into this like, no, let's actually do something valuable with this. Let's raise some money and um, sponsor or, or showcase the MyLime data um, stuff that's going on and, and rate along with the raising awareness, like get people not inside our close circle, like get anyone, we anyone who can come. Um, so we had like uh, local f- like flyers going around and stuff to get people locally to come. It was really cool. Yeah. We, we talked, we talked to a couple different Lyme offices in Utah and um, a few of them were sponsors of the event. And so we had a lot of patients from the community and just friends and all sorts of random people that showed up, but it was a great success. And we chose my Lyme data because my family has been involved with the Lyme disease.org association. And that's one of the big projects that's being pushed right now is accurate data collection from patients who have gone through Lyme disease, treated it and are treating it and using this data to make informed decisions of how to better improve the patient experience and give that data to the community for free. So now let's frame uh, the two of you and your relationship for our listeners, because you've now made it pretty clear that awareness is important for you too, right? And you wanted to make sure that you could use this film as a vehicle for bringing awareness to folks in your community. Um, And you also uh, have made it very clear that um, you want information to be made available to folks so they can make good decisions. So let's talk about why you you two young men have have been inspired to do this kind of work uh, by way of uh, first defining your relationship, because I understand that the two of you have been friends since your childhood. That's right. Yeah, we went to elementary school with each other until about third grade and then split ways to different schools. And then we stayed in touch. And then in college, we became roommates. And and so, so talk to us a little bit about Again, what the relationship was like uh, when you were were children, and whether or not you believe that uh, having lived in the same community or in in close proximity to one another, you're not in exactly the same town, um, played some role in the likelihood that both of you would suffer from this terrible disease. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about how like us living close as we. Sorry, let me rephrase what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, like, and and I don't mean just because you live in close proximity to one another, but you're both living in an environment where you're likely to come in contact with ticks, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, like we, I probably the the theory is that I got bit when I was in scout camp when I was a little kid. Um, and yeah, it, it, I definitely would have, would not have been diagnosed properly or even known anything about Lyme disease if it wasn't for Josh and his family and their experience with it. Um, yeah, it's just all been connected and honestly, just tender mercies from God that have put us together and helped us get diagnosed and support each other. It's so. Uh, it's been a journey for yeah, sure. So Josh, why don't you frame for us? Because I should have asked this question. You, you folks are from Utah, right? So, um, and and I shared with you when we were we were having our uh, our pre-interview conversation is I I never went to Utah until this year, and I was I was uh, I was really mesmerized by the beauty, the natural beauty of Utah, right? And I'm sure as as folks who have lived in that community, grew up in that community, you were just called to you know to hike and to and to 
um, and, and, and engage in outdoor activities. I mean, you just like it just sort of like you just feel called to do that when you're in that beautiful part of the country. So, uh, you know, I mean, the first thing my friend and I did when we arrived before the conference is we went on a hike because it's just such a beautiful place. Right. So I'm assuming that's something that the two of you were doing all the time. And, and it sounds to me that one of the reasons why the two of you are so passionate about awareness and getting folks information is because you were not aware and you did not have the information that you needed to be safe. Totally. Yeah. I mean, living in Utah, there is such a huge pull for the outdoors and you live 20 or 30 minutes away from, you know, the mountains and ski resorts and things like that and mountain biking trails. And Ethan actually did mountain biking competitively in high school. Um, and I would go out hiking with friends or on youth group trips or scout camps or things like that. Um, you're always outside playing in the bushes, you know, there's a high chance that, um, you can get a tick bite. And I've also traveled across the United States too. And so is Ethan. And so pinpointing exactly where um, the site of infection was that is a question we'll probably never have answered. But uh, um, yeah, it's definitely just been awesome that our paths have crossed and we've stayed friends and that we've been able to help other people along the way too. So Ethan, why don't you talk to us about what your, your pre-college education was like and, and to the extent that you would think as as um, you know as folks from Utah uh, who are educated in Utah who are all called to participate in outdoor activities uh, that part of your educational experience either in health courses or in 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 gym classes that you would have been taught about ticks and tick diseases and how to not only just be aware of of, of the threat but also how to protect yourself from getting sick. Yeah, honestly, that education was not there for me. Um, like I, I wasn't tick aware. I have, I thought Lyme disease was maybe somewhere on the East coast, but I'd never heard anything about it. Um, so yeah, before, before being roommates with, with Josh and the being diagnosed there. Yeah. I was not tick aware at all. Um, and that's, that's a big part of why we did our um, fundraiser and showing that documentary was just because there's no education around it. We need, we needed to raise awareness so people could get the help that they really need. So Josh, what about you as a, as an active outdoorsman? Um, and I'm assuming from a family of outdoorsy people, uh, did you have any information about ticks? Uh, were you, did you know what a tick was? Uh, do you remember being bitten by ticks? I mean, give me, give me some sense of what your tick awareness was uh, before you got sick. Yeah, very little to none. Um, I mean, you learn about how to remove a tick and things like that in Boy Scouts, but it's not like we had any live ticks to practice with or anything. Um, and so you you pass it off when you're 11, 12 years old and Scouts is part of your merit badges and your requirements. But that was basically it. And the culture in Utah is definitely not, okay, you go hiking, you're going to check your hair and check your body for ticks after you go outside. Like that's that's not really pushed at all like it is on the East Coast, from what I've heard. Um, and when people ask, like, oh, do you remember a tick bite? I'm like, no, I don't. But also, do you remember every bug bite you've ever had in your life? And you can't remember every single bug bite you've ever had, too. So, it, you know, Ethan, we're, we're to the point here on the East Coast where I literally check myself every day, even during the winter. Right. Every day when I come in, when I take off my clothes and I and I get into my pajamas, uh, I do a tick check. Uh, so you folks are not even tick checking after you're going hiking in your and you're uh, engaging in outdoor activities. And we're to the point here on the East Coast where we check all the time every day uh, because we know that it's likely that, you know, we are being bitten by ticks. And not only don't we remember tick bites, as Josh had argued, I mean, we don't remember bug bites, as Josh had argued, but in most cases, because ticks are so sophisticated, we don't feel the bite notes. We don't feel when they're attacked. We don't feel anything because they have, uh, you know, very sophisticated principles in their spit, so that um, and proteins in their spit, so that so that we don't feel anything. So, so Ethan, talk to me about that. Um, you know, and, and how you know you've now radically changed um, the way you engage in checking yourself so that you don't become uh, reinfected. Yeah, I definitely am so much more aware. I always check. I make sure I spray my clothes when I go out with um, tick repellent. I always use bug spray. I'm always checking. Um, and, and, and a lot of it is getting other people on board with that as well. Um, and just because, I don't know, it's, it's, it's 
it's not really talked about Lyme disease here on the, on, in Utah. And I feel like the West coast in general, um, everyone thinks, Oh, that's an East coast problem. Um, but it's not, it's, it's everywhere. It's here. So Josh, talk to us about when you first became symptomatic, right? Because I know between the two of you as, as uh, college roommates, you were actually diagnosed uh, during your childhood. So give us, give us a sense of when you first started to get sick and what those symptoms look like. Yeah. So a little bit of background here. So my older brother, I need to give him a shout out because uh, he was the one that originally got diagnosed with Lyme in our family through lots of trial and error. And um, he was serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Toronto, Canada. And he got sick there and didn't know it was Lyme disease at the time, came home. Um, his health was severely declining over the next year, year and a half. Um, eventually he got a Lyme disease diagnosis. Um, he had to do uh, a pick line in his arm several different times to do lots of rounds of antibiotics to save his life. He lost a lot of weight um, and was just really frail. Um, and so he was dealing with all of that in around 2010, 11, 12, 13, um, and then figuring out all the co-infection treatments and things like that. And it was, it was a big journey for him and for our family. And then uh, in about 2014, um, I started to show some symptoms of fatigue and a little bit of arthritis um, and just muscular pain. And to the point where it wasn't like I was just taking like a little half an hour nap every day, it was turning into three or four hours or I was sleeping in through first and second period at school every day. Um, and so my dad went and got me tested and uh, sure enough, I came back positive for different tick infections. And then I started my own treatment journey there. So let's talk about your brother's diagnosis for a minute. Um, do you believe that your brother was infected while he was in Canada or on the mission? Or do you believe that he was, he was infected when he was at home in Utah and he just began to show symptoms when he was uh, on the mission trip? Yeah, I don't want to speak for him here, but he does, from my memory, recall being bit once or twice while in Canada, in Toronto. Um, and he remembers his health starting to decline after that. Now, one of the things we see often in this community is that people are diagnosed with what uh, one of our past guests called the supermarket diagnosis, meaning it's easier to get diagnosed when you're having a conversation with somebody in the, in, in the supermarket than it is when going to a doctor. So again, not, not speaking for your brother, but just was, was your brother diagnosed by a doctor after having, having shown his symptoms or, or was, was your brother um, one of those people who came in contact with or your family coming in contact with another family that was aware of what the symptoms were of Lyme and that led to your brother's diagnosis? Um, from my memory, my brother was diagnosed by a doctor, but through the help of my uh, my oldest sister, who was a nurse, who is a nurse practitioner, um, through lots of extensive research on her part, and just on our family's part too, and going to dozens of different doctors. I was pretty young when this was going on. I was in junior high, um, and then I got my diagnosis in this my sophomore year of high school. Okay, so we're going to ask you to pause F one second because Matt's going to take you through uh, your 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 treatment plan after your diagnosis. But I'm going to now. Now flip over here uh, to you, Ethan, and talk to you about your diagnosis, because um, although Josh's brother was diagnosed by a, by a medical professional, you know, I, I'm going to call it a quasi supermarket diagnosis because he had a family member who was doing research and between having some medical expertise and doing her own research, um, you know, she was able to help um, his brother get diagnosed, but he was diagnosed not by a doctor, but by a family member seeing that he had the same symptoms. And now, of course, your diagnosis gets, uh, gets um, uh, you know, sort of the benefit of family members helping Josh's brother, Josh ultimately getting diagnosed because of his brother's symptoms, and now you get diagnosed because of that. So talk to us about how, how Ethan, you, you got diagnosed. Yeah, my journey, I don't know, I, even in high school, I was, I was experiencing symptoms. I was tired all the time, sleeping way too much. Um, and a lot of my symptoms were mental. Uh, I was extremely depressed, was having panic attacks. Um, and then I uh, graduated high school and I went and served a mission for my church uh, out in Houston, Texas. So I, I was in Texas for a while and I, I got there right as Hurricane Harvey hit. Um, and and along with some mold poisoning that came from cleaning up houses from the hurricane, 
and things like that, my health just like dramatically, um, I was extremely depressed and suicidal. Uh, I, I think I had lost like 30 or 40 pounds. Wow. Uh, just very, just, I was sick. I didn't know. I just, I just thought I, I thought I was going crazy. I thought, um, I couldn't think clearly my brain fog was so bad. Uh, and so I, I came home and it, it was two years of, of just like, oh, I'm just depressed. Oh, I'm just having panic attacks. Um, oh, I just am sleeping for 15 plus hours. Like, it's just, that's just me. I'm just broken. Um, and, and, and I had, I felt like I had no answer. Um, and then Josh and I became roommates and, and we'd, we'd both be laying in bed at 1 PM and look across at each other from our room and just be like, what is going on? Why are we just so tired? Um, and, and Josh was like, Hey, I, th I think you should get tested for Lyme because we're, we're having these similar experiences and uh, sure enough, yeah, that came back positive. And it was, it was the biggest answer to me. It was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what has been missing. Like, and, and then I started my treatments and I did six months of really hardcore. I dropped out of school. I put in a pick line um, and, and treated really heavily. And it was just a night and day difference. I felt like myself again. I was, I was more social. I I could get normal, almost normal sleep. Um, and, and it was just a dramatic change through all of that. So let me tie this back to my line data, right? Because one of the things that Matt and I have noticed when we look at the my line data um, information that's available is the number one symptom that almost everyone has in common when they have chronic Lyme disease is fatigue, right? And mm -hmm. so let's frame that for you two guys. And of course, this is an audio only podcast, but you're both very athletic looking. Um, and now you're <laughs> two, two very fit young men who are now college students at one o'clock in the afternoon in bed, looking at each other like, what's going on here? You know, like, yeah, yeah. what's the deal, right? And now you're trying to figure it out together. And of course you do figure it out together because of what was going on there. So first talk to me about how, you know, uh, if you had the information for example, that the MyLine data program makes available to you about the symptoms, how that might have been a shortcut for you and why that's important for you to get, the, why it's important for the two of you to get that information out so people can get an earlier diagnosis than even the two of you did. Yeah, I think like when I've talked to other people that we've helped get diagnosed, we like, we kind of just share our experiences and, and it's always so relatable. They're like, oh my gosh, I feel that too. Oh my gosh. And, and I think the my line data just showcases that, that like, Hey, there, you're not alone. People are going through this. And when you see that those symptoms are like the same and you realize it's not normal, you realize, Oh, I shouldn't be feeling like this. Um, and it just helps get diagnosed so much quicker. Yeah. And one thing to highlight too, is like from that data, we know that people are before they get diagnosed, they're seeing multiple doctors. Um, it's taking many months to years to get a diagnosis. And many of these people have overlapping symptoms, you know, um, all these people that are in the database have very similar stories and symptoms and those profiles start to line up over time. And you can see these stories unfolding that are basically carbon copies of each other, but depending on which tick diseases people have and how severe, um, those symptoms can, can vary. But certainly, you know, one of the things that you guys have talked with us about um, is, is how there are many people uh, you believe, uh, or, or at least you speculate, there are many people that have Lyme disease that are, that are not diagnosed with Lyme disease. And one of the things that, you know, I think certainly young people should be taking into account is if they're, they're suffering from very, very painful uh, um, fatigue or, you know, the, and they're young and they're athletic and they look like you guys. You know, one of the things they really have to take into consideration is whether or not they have Lyme disease, right? I mean, it's just not normal for young people, college kids who are at the, you know, who should be at the, you know, the the peak of their health to be laying in bed at one o'clock in the afternoon wondering what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's hard too, because I think sometimes teenagers get stereotyped as being lazy or they just, you know, they don't want to listen to their parents or this or that, but 
there's a certain point where it's like, no, like this is, this is an illness and this needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be checked out by a doctor. Um, and potentially they have Lyme disease, you know? So, so one of the things that I'd want to put on the Ethan and Josh, uh, billboard, if we had one, Ethan was teenagers, if you're exhausted, you're not lazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So I want to talk with you guys about one more thing before Matt takes you through your, your treatment journey. And that is, uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing another parallel here, right? Because uh, one of the things that we, we've, we've learned through the 400 podcast interviews that we've done here is, um, and, and by the way, we define Lyme disease as only a chronic condition, not as an acute condition, right? But what, what's happening is your immune system is, 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 is worn out, and, and that's when all of these microbes are, are, are causing you to become chronically, uh, chronically ill, right? And, and there are a couple of things that, that we see developing in this pattern before people, people get uh, chronically sick. And, and some of that has to do with travel, right? Um, that that um, um, it is immunosuppressive to fly, right? And, and one of the things that we've seen here is at least with Josh's brother and with you, Ethan, uh, you both became uh, very sick after you went on your mission trip. And part of that for both of you may have been air travel. Um, it is, of course, going to be stressful to be away from your families when you're going to go on this on this trip. And in your case, Ethan, you also came in contact with uh, with mold. And we know mold is immunosuppressive. And it's very, very common for people to have mold exposure before they ultimately uh, become chronically ill. So I'd like each of you to talk to me about why you believe, or if you believe, that part of the reason you became chronically ill is because you were under stresses that you otherwise hadn't been under, and that led to you becoming chronically ill. Yeah, I think for me, like like I had said before, um, that mission, the mission trip that I did, I I was experiencing experiencing symptoms, but it wasn't as it wasn't as acute. I was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll go to therapy. Yeah, I'll just try to sleep more. I didn't really think too much of it. Um, but after after the mold exposure, um, I think that just like I don't know, it just kind of tipped the scales of my immune system. That threshold where I was, I was doing well enough. My body was keeping it at bay enough. Um, and then I, it just got overloaded and, and it just all, yeah, tipped that went over that threshold. And I think that is, is what had the most significant impact on, on the extreme extremity of, is that the right word the extremity? Yeah, how, the, how, extreme, yeah. how extreme it was for me. Because it, it was, it was, it was, it was dramatically, dramatically worse. So, so uh, it, it sounds to me that your body was managing the microbes until it couldn't, right? Yeah. And, and the mold was was sort of the breaking point for your immune system and your immune system could no longer manage these microbes and you just crashed. Yep. Yeah, that's that's how I think it all went down. So so Josh, tell us about you. I mean, you were younger. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you uh, went on a mission trip, but this would have probably been before you would have gone on a mission trip anyway, right? Yeah, so when I was ninth grade ninth grade going into 10th grade that summer um i remember starting to take naps and like it was half an hour naps then it was two hour naps and then it was i'd come home from school and i would sleep till dinner time and my mom or dad would wake me up and say hey it's time for dinner and then i'd go back to sleep after dinner at eight o'clock you know um and then i would sleep for more than 12 hours a day. And like, it just was slowly creeping in. Um, and mind you at the same time, my brother was dealing with even much more extreme Lyme disease at this point. And so a lot of, um, energy was going into taking care of him as well too. And so I was, I had started with a little bit more mild treatments, um, just cause that's the way that the, the cookie crumbled. Um, but yeah, it started, it just started small and then I was just slowly just losing energy. And then my post-exertional fatigue became really bad playing sports or, um, just going out and having fun. And then I'd just be super tired the next day or even for two days after, um, to the point that I was like, I can't even wake up for school like half the time. So Josh and Ethan, before we get into what you did to treat, because everybody listening is going to want to hear what you did to treat, what worked, what didn't work, what hacks you may have, what you would have done differently. 
I just want to highlight a few things. And the first of which is we are huge fans of Lyme disease.org. I know Rich said this, but I have to say it as well. Dorothy Leland, who's now the president, is a big friend, of, a huge friend of ours. We've had her on the podcast, episode 120. For anybody listening who wants to learn about my Lyme data or, or Lyme disease.org and what they're doing over there. And we also have had Dorothy Leland on with her daughter, Rachel Leland, most recently on episode 392. And her book, Finding Resilience, which is a book co-authored by Dorothy Leland and her daughter, was really, really powerful and hugely inspirational about how sick you can be and how if you don't give up, you can feel better and you can get your life back and you can be happy and live a successful life. And I do want to pivot over to, I think, Ethan, you were talking about the mold experience you had when you went on the the mission trip, right? Right yeah. after the hurricane. And one of the things that you said that jumped out at me was shortly after you started to have mostly mental health related symptoms. And I can't help but think about an interview we did with Dr. Jill Carnahan on episode 362 of our podcast, where she talked about how mold exposure and there's different types of mycotoxins or basically the chemicals or the compounds that make up mold, depending on the, you know, the strain or the type of mold, it can have impacts on us psychologically. Some people have depression, some people have anxiety. And there's one story of people who get angry. And in one case, they they had this house where I believe it was three people in a row that lived in this house were homicidal and had charges, criminal charges for attempted murder or or potential murder. And that's all in the podcast as well. So have you thought about that, Ethan, just as a quick side note before we continue on with your treatment, about the impact of mold on your mental health and potentially mold triggering and activating the Lyme and also a lot of your neuropsychological symptoms as well? Yeah. Oh, it, it absolutely. It's just either, either sparks the Lyme even more or, or had it in effect all on its own on my mental health. Um, because yeah, I was, I was not okay. I, I, I wasn't in a, in a safe mentality. Um, and, and I needed a lot, a lot of help, um, because of that. And yeah, that mold, Jeez, it was kind of just, it's the catalyst that just sparked everything. Um, it was like, okay, let's get you treated. Let's, let's test for mold. Let's test for bacteria. Let's test Lyme. Um, and it was like, let's just, let's just test everything. Um, and so my initial process of like getting diagnosed, we just did the whole panel. We did everything. Um, I probably did so many vials of blood that we sent off to different labs everywhere. We're like, we just need to figure this out because it, it's very clearly, um, a, a biological thing and not just, not just, um, on the base layer of, of depression and anxiety, not to invalidate that at all, but like it, it was, it was very extreme and I wasn't myself and, um, yeah, that, that be testing for that mold and, and realizing, oh, Hey, that's probably what sparked everything was pretty eye opening for me. Right. And in addition to the mold triggering the mental health, right, the mold that that compound in your body can trigger mental health symptoms and really cause it. We, we just did a post recently on our social media about, you know, titled Lyme bacteria linked to mental health. And this the name of the study was microbes and mental illness, past, present and future. And, they, you know, Dr. Rosalie Greenberg, who's another brilliant neuropsychologist we had on our podcast, she believes that all of these psychological conditions have a you know pathogenic root cause like some other psychologists have had on the podcast, where they talk about, you know, back in the day, they would think it was, you know, you were, you were demon possessed or you were crazy or you, you know, all these things and how now that we've progressed, we're seeing these microbes are causing mental illness in so many people. And these microbes are now on the rise, mental illness is on the rise and they're making that connection there. So I think that's a really important topic to discuss and to not lose sight of in, in this community. But I do want to pivot over to Josh because I'm keep going off on these tangents here and, and keep it keep it in perspective, right? So Josh, you were the first one to get diagnosed. You were you first got sick when you were 14. You get diagnosed about a year later when you were 15. You know, you had unfortunately, but fortunately for you, you you had experience with Lyme disease in your family. You mentioned you started off pretty slow. Can you tell our listeners what you did to treat it first? That was a slow strategy you took and and let us know how it worked for you, if if at all. Uh, yeah, initially started um, taking antibiotics like doxycycline um, to start, and then that morphed into taking two to three to four even antibiotics at a time. Um, and these were all different, you know, different kinds of antibiotics that are cyst busters is the term. Um, if you rotate two to three of those, you know, for longer periods of time, that can really help um, break down biofilms and, you know, get the persister bacteria out of your body. But I mean, I was rotating to treat 
Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia all at the same time. Um, so I was taking different rotations to, you know, treat those different co-infections as well too. And then um, as time went on, um, I did that for probably a couple of years and probably a year and a half in, I feel like I saw some real progress um, just from taking orals and, you know, trying to support my gut at the same time and taking lots of supplements to help with vitamins and minerals and immune support and things like that. Probably a year and a half. And by the time I was a senior in high school, I, I had a significant amount of my energy and life back, um, but still would randomly get really tired um, or symptoms would come and go. Um, and then I actually did IV antibiotics for a semester of my freshman year of college. Hey, Josh, can, do you mind if I jump in real quick? Apologies yeah, to interrupt. Sure. But so before we get into the IV antibiotics for about a year, a year and a half, two years, you mentioned you were started off with just oxy. Then you did the combination therapy of several oral antibiotics to address, you know, Lyme, co-infections, persister cells of Lyme, right? But mm -hmm. You also said that you combined herbals and GI support and immune support with that, which I think is a really important component when treating Lyme to make sure you support your body and don't just go from the kill approach, which is the strong antimicrobial piece, which is all those antibiotics, right? Do you mm -hmm. recall what you took for your gut, for your immune system and the herbals you took to complement the antibiotics you were taking at the time? Yeah, I mean, probiotics, I uh, couldn't tell you the exact strain, but general probiotics. And then um, I did different rounds with Zang, uh, Artemisia, and HH2. Um, and then I've also done a little bit of like Japanese knotweed, um, cat's claw, things like that. Um, and then colloidal silver as well, too. So those were some of the more herbal um, alternative type of medicines that I've done. And before we go on to the IV antibiotics again, can you put in perspective how, what were your symptoms as a whole? Like what were your worst symptoms that you had? Cause you mentioned by the time you went to college, you had your energy back and your fatigue was improved, but what, what other symptoms did you have that were really debilitating in addition to fatigue, if any? Yeah, fatigue. Um, and then I would say musculoskeletal pain, um, just like feeling like a general sense of malaise and uh, muscle soreness, stiffness, just like the nerve pain sometimes too. Um, I would get tingling, um, either in my feet or in my legs. And then sometimes I'd have a twitch, like a muscular twitch in my leg as well, too, that would come and go. Um, that's mostly what I remember as of right now. And then obviously when you're tired, um, and things like that, depression can kind of kick in, but, uh, I would say the fatigue and muscular pain were definitely the worst for me. And the good news is you were rebounding enough to be able to go into college, it sounds like. So you were a freshman, I believe you said, in college when you started the IVs. Was that correct? Yeah. So I was preparing to go on that mission trip. And so I wanted to um, just get my body as healthy as I as I could be. Um, and so I did a couple days a week of IV antibiotics for a semester of college. And so I did high dose vitamin C. I did ozone. Um, I did IV zithromycin and IV silver. Um, I never did uh, rocephin, but uh, yeah, I did zithromycin, silver, and ozone. I did a lot of ozone. So talk to us about the silver, because the colloidal silver, we've heard people tell us that they think it's amazing, and other people say, ah, oh, it's a scam, it really doesn't do anything. Where do you guys land in that in that position there? I definitely think there's benefits to it. That's my own personal opinion, though. Um, I do think it is harder on your veins and your body compared to other IVs out there. Uh, just the way that it makes you feel is definitely worse, like immediately compared to other IVs, antibiotics. Do you think that's because it's working so quickly to kill things off that it's just taxing your system because it's working so quickly? I maybe, yeah, I think it's just pretty potent. So, so, uh, Ethan, we're going to get into your, you know, your, I'm trying to go uh, chronologically here. But now yeah. we're worried about the college time. You know, you're you're starting, you know, you I believe you got sick around 16 though, Ethan, right? So maybe you can kind of tell us this overlap here of of Josh, you know, in high school, you know, starting freshman year of college. When did you first get sick, Ethan? And tell us how severe your symptoms were, you know, leading up to your diagnosis when you were 20. Yeah. I, in in high school, my junior, senior year, I I really just was was dealing with depression really heavily. Um and, and was, was going to therapy really consistently, um, which was really good for me. 
Um, and, and I was also just always tired. I was sleeping either way too much, or I would be, uh, I have insomnia and sleep hardly at all. Um, and so those were kind of what I was experiencing then. Um, but I didn't attribute it to anything Lyme related or, or thought that it could be anything like that. Um, and then, yeah, fast, fast forward to the, the mission and the mold exposure and coming home and then going to so many different psychiatrists like, hey, this, this, this kid needs help. He needs to find a med that's going to keep him stable. And honestly, I probably tried 20 to 25, maybe more different um, antidepressants or mood stabilizers and things like that. And, and nothing was helping. Um, and then a little bit forward, Josh and I move in together. Um, and this is the college, right? Into college. Yeah. Okay. Our, our sophomore, year. sophomore year of college and just start to realize and kind of become a little bit more aware of, of how Josh was feeling and kind of just thinking like, yeah, I'm kind of experiencing that too. Um, and, and opening that door of, okay, let's, let's get tested. Let's look, let's see what we can do. Um, and Ethan, then, yeah. you, were there any, were there any, um, in addition to the, into the, the psychological parts, what, did you have any physical symptoms? Cause some people have heavily, just mostly psychological. Some people have a mix. Some people have mostly physical. Where did you fall in that spectrum? Were there, with, in addition to fatigue, was there any kind of, you know, nerve pain, things like that, body pain, headaches, uh, you know, any, anything neurological besides the psychological? Yeah, it was, it was mostly psychological, but I did, yeah, have a lot of headaches. I have my elbows and my knees are pretty bad, just nerve, um, nerve pain there. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing too dramatic. It was more psychological and just fatigue and brain fog. Did any of your doctors ever suggest it could be something, you know, from a pathogen or some sort of illness causing this, or were they all just so focused on you have a mental health problem and we're going to, we're going to treat you, treat the mental health with some sort of psychological meds. Yeah, that was, that was pretty much it. They're just, it's a mental health problem was, was the idea. And Josh, not to put you on the spot here, but fellow Lyme guy over there, right? You, you've had this since you were 14, you know, at, at least, right. You were sick when you were 14, you were diagnosed when you were 15. Did you ever see or think Lyme in your friend, Ethan, up until the time he got diagnosed at 20? Uh, not, I mean, when we became roommates, I think it started to click and register a little bit more and we started to have a lot more conversations and talks about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would talk to my dad too, and just be like, this is what's going on with Ethan, like these kinds of things. And then my dad was kind of the one that really pushed and suggested he was like, you know, he should probably just get tested for Lyme. Like you should just push him on that. And then my dad kind of was the one that pushed Ethan to finally do it all the yeah. way. So I give him that credit there. Yeah. So Ethan, I wonder, because, you know, again, we'll go back to my Lyme data. Their studies have shown that I don't remember the stat, the percentage, but it's around 90% of people with Lyme are, are female, not male. Right. And I can tell you on this podcast, we're hard pressed to find men with Lyme disease on social media, which is generally where we find people. They reach out to us or we find them on social media. It's heavily, heavily female. And when we look at our analytics from our social media, from our website, it has a gender breakdown. And I believe, Rich, the last time I checked, it was 92%, something, it was, it was, it was over 90, I think it was 92% of people that were female coming to our website and social media. So for me, I had a hard time sharing my symptoms and feeling like I was, I was ashamed and embarrassed. So did either one of you, I guess we'll start with you, Ethan, did you feel ashamed to share your symptoms or talk about it? And you think looking back in hindsight, that was, that did you a disservice because, you know, other people that have been through the Lyme experience couldn't relate and share their thoughts on, on potentially you having Lyme disease. Um, no, I don't think I ever really felt embarrassed because for me, it was so much of a, of just an answer and, and it just felt like, oh, Hey, now I, now I know what this is. And yeah, I was, I was pretty open about it when I first got diagnosed. I, I told all my friends, I, I, I shared that and it actually, honestly, it, it really opened so many doors with other people who were sick too, because I would say like, yeah, I was dealing with all this for so long. Um, and I got tested and I started treating and it, I was so much better. And, and people I would talk to were just like, Hey, they were like, Oh my gosh, I've been there too. 
like, yeah, I was, I've been, I've been seriously depressed. I've been seriously fatigued. Um, can you help me? And, and just sharing that experience and not, not kind of hiding that fact about my life really, I, I think was able, I was able to help other people because of that. And, and tying into that, Josh's dad, when he, when he helped me get diagnosed, he said, Hey, if we're right about this and you have Lyme, he's like, I need you to make me one promise that you just pay it forward, that you will help other people and you pay it forward and, and make sure other people get the, the treatment that they need. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. So Josh, I have to ask because it seems like you both had the same doctor, right? So Ethan, when you got diagnosed, you went and saw Josh's doctor? Yeah, that's correct. So Josh, was this the same doctor that was treating your brother as well? Uh, yes. Okay. My, dad, my brother saw multiple doctors, but yes, same one. So here in New York, where Lyme is extremely prevalent, it's very difficult to find a doctor who will treat you with any kind of antibiotics beyond 21 days. And frankly, sometimes it's even shorter. You have to almost beg for 21 days here. So what kind of doctor was this that you guys found, Josh? And how did you, you know, how did you find them? How did you find the doctor who was willing to treat long term with oral and then do IV? So that's really rare for a regular doctor here, an MD or a regular primary care physician that, that we see in New York, at least. So, yeah, um, a lot of experimentation and research um, of other Lyme studies, I feel like led um, my doctor to be willing to treat, you know, with multiple cyst buster antibiotics at the same time. Um, and a lot of that research comes from, you know, the sacrifice and hours of doctors that have treated thousands of patients, you know, like Dr. Horowitz and people uh, like Ray Stricker as well, that have really done the time to see what it takes to improve patients, you know, and they are willing to, you know, and they, they talk about it with you. They're like this, you know, this is a challenge to treat Lyme disease and uh, you will hurt you know, you will have herxing symptoms and, but you will come out stronger and feeling better on the other side. You just have to be consistent and stick with it. So Josh, thank God you found this doctor and thank God Ethan had this doctor when he got sick. So I'm going to pivot back for Ethan. So now you're, you're going through all this. You are about 20 years old. You're a sophomore in college now with Josh. You get the advice of Josh and his dad. You get tested and you have Lyme disease, right? Was there anything else that came up with that? Did you test for anything else? And and if so, what were you testing positive for in addition to Lyme? Yeah, I have some Borrelia, Babesia, Bartonella, um, like co-infections, Lyme itself, and tick-borne relapsing fever. Ah, just a couple, right? Just just a just a little handful. Yeah, <laughs> knows what. <laughs> um, so, what, what was your treatment for all those things? Yeah, along with that too is all the all the mold toxicity and, and heavily have heavy mold poisoning too. Um, so my treatment plan was was a mix of everything, and uh, I was I was at a point where it, it needed to be a dramatic um, kind of attack on all this stuff going on in my body, and so I took the semester off of school. I. Um, yeah, I, I remember I was, I got the call from Josh's dad that the results came back positive on New Year's Eve. Oh man, what a way to ruin, well, I guess, did it I ruin your New Year's or did it make you, were you <laughs> going, happy or going sad? Into, going yeah. into, no, into the new no. year, going into 2020. And uh, yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm I'm going out of school. I, I wasn't doing well in school anyway, so it wasn't that, wasn't that bad. I, I honestly had failed most of my classes just because I was so sick. And uh, so I, I said, I'm taking off school and we're going to, we're going to do this right. I'm going to go in as much as possible and working with our doctor, he was, he was very like, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's rock and roll. Um, and it was a, a full spectrum of treatments. And quite frankly, my, my brain was so foggy around that time that I don't remember exactly everything that I took um, or what I went through my, my dad, who's my hero, just kind of took, took control over, over that and helped me just like, Hey, here's your pills. Just, just take them. Like <laughs> rather than, uh, rather than me having to like learn everything and, 
Um, so my, my dad helped me out so much in, in those treatments and took that off my plate for me, which was just the biggest blessing, um, to just help me focus on being able to get better myself. Um, so I, I don't remember exactly what my treatments were, but I, I did get a pick line put in for all the IVs that I was doing. Um, plenty of IV antibiotics and lots of ozone. Um, so yeah, I had a little, little pick line in my arm. And, and I think that was um, really helpful for me with this route of like, hey, we're going we're gonna to kind of nuke everything. And, and that route of just a really strong treatment um, was, was really benefic- beneficial for me because it just was a complete drastic change very quickly um, because I was at a point where I needed, I needed that help. Um, but after that, I, I started treating a little bit more like just slow and steady, um, and mostly oral antibiotics, not as many IVs. And, and I did, diso- I did do disulfiram for a while. Um, I do want to get to the disulfiram, but I noticed that you uh, also mentioned that you did glutathione and on your questionnaire for this podcast, you said you found out you were allergic to it. Can you share with us how you, cause that that's, I don't think we've heard anybody in this podcast tell us they've been allergic to glutathione. So can you share with us how you found that out and what that was like? Yeah, I was, I was doing IVs of glutathione and every time I would just go throw up and, and I'd feel so, so sick and I couldn't, couldn't handle it. Um, but I found that in like really small, small doses, if I did like a little, uh, tablet or something that it it was manageable and I wouldn't get sick, but in higher doses, uh, through, uh, IV push, I, I got really, I would get really sick from it. And my doctor was like, yeah, that's probably an allergic reaction, um, to having such a high amount of glutathione put in. So before we get to the, uh, to the disulfiram, I do want to ask that you, you both, I mean, and again, for context for our listeners, so Ethan, I believe you were you were huge into mountain mountain biking. You were river rafting. You were climbing. You were you were playing tennis. I mean, you had this crazy energy. You were super adventurous, and you were just this really athletic guy, right? Yeah. And I believe you both mentioned that you had this sort of exercise intolerance, or or because of the fatigue, you know, really impacted your ability to move. So at this point, when you were really aggressively treating Ethan and just starting all this, were you able to move or get any kind of exercise at all? And if so, what role do you think that played in your healing? Yeah, I I was not exercising at all. I was I was either sitting in a, a chair doing IVs for a few hours, or I was sleeping. Um, my my body couldn't handle anything else. So Josh, what about you? When you were first diagnosed, where you know it seems like you were pretty athletic as well. Were were you moving? Were you exercising? Or were you too sick to 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 do that at that point? Uh, I was still like doing stuff, but not to the level or amount of time that I wanted to. Um, cause I just knew that I'm like, okay, I got to go home and take a nap after, or I'm going to sleep, you know, 30% more tomorrow. If I go play basketball with my friends tonight, um, could definitely push through and like, you know, go work out with my friends, but it was, it was definitely tougher, um, for sure. And the recovery, even going to like a school dance in high school, like the next day, like I was significantly more tired, you know, that's not like, it's like, like, yeah, you're dancing around, but it's not like you're going to the gym and lifting weights. So let me ask you a hard question and it's feel free to say you, you simply don't know, right? I, I was exercising tolerant for quite a while and we had all these big doctors, these leaders in the community tell us if you can't move a little bit, it's really going to prevent you from really opening up your healing potential. And, you know, some of them say, like, if you're bed bound, you have to just do gentle yoga in your bed. If you're sitting there, you can do stretches and then you have to gradually do more and more and more. But do you think as time went on and you, as you were treating, you started to be able to move more and that really helped fast track your healing? Or do you think in your cases that wasn't as accurate as, as we're hearing from all these doctors? I guess, Ethan, we'll start with you if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I absolutely like when I, when I was treating so heavily, my body just didn't have the energy to do much more. But when I started feeling better, um, I, I started, I actually got pretty into yoga. Um, and that was super helpful for me, um, mentally and physically, uh, just doing that was, was really helpful. Um, I, I wasn't back to the same where I could go mountain bike or, or do any river rafting or climbing or hiking like I wasn't back to that but yoga was like super 
I don't know, like my saving grace, I could just go and do, do some yoga and, and feel better and feel like I've moved. And, um, so yeah, that was kind of my experience with the, the exercise side of things. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? I mean, you're, you're stretching, you're moving, you're allowing your, your blood to flow, you're allowing your lymphatic system to move and your body's working hard to rid itself of all these pathogens and all this die off. So I think it makes sense that as you're assisting your body to move your lymphatic system and move your blood around, you're helping your body heal, but it's, it's that balance. So Josh, what did you find in your experience with that in this regard? Yeah, I feel like the post-exertional fatigue has definitely decreased over the years. Um, I definitely know like if I'm pushing it too hard, um, but uh, I think recovery is also an important thing too with diet and supplements and things like that. Um, and just making sure you're getting the proper nutrition so that your body can refuel itself after a workout or, you know, going skiing or playing basketball or going hiking, like any of those things. Um, it's definitely gone a lot better um, that I can go hike and do all those things that I want to do now. Um, well, let's I, get a sneak peek, Josh, because I think last year you made a pretty cool accomplishment, uh, you know, yeah. line. Can you? and I know I'm yeah. getting ahead, but if, this is a good time to share it. If you don't mind, give a little teaser here. For sure. So um, I said to my dad, so I'm the youngest of five kids. My, my parents are retired now. Um, and I was like, dad, we should go hike Mount Kilimanjaro. I was like, that would be so cool. And he was like, okay, you plan the trip. Let's do it. And I was like, for reals? And he was like, he was like, yeah, find us the, like, find us all the good plans, find me the best options, you know, and at what price points and let's make it happen. Let's start, let's go later this summer. Let's start hiking, you know? And so I went and hiked just close to my hometown, like every day for like six months, basically. <laughs> um, and I was roommates with Ethan at the time and like four or five o'clock every day, I was walking out the door to go on a hike for an hour. And then I'd come <laughs> back. I'd always ask who wants to come with me. And they'd all say no. <laughs> Cause the I problem was, was that he consistently did a hike that was just not fun. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was just, just super steep switchbacks, steep switchbacks no one for like an hour. And that was, that was it. So, and there's a lot of pretty hikes, but I just really liked that one for some reason. It, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I got to, got to hike Mount Kilimanjaro and that was that was an awesome accomplishment. Um, got to do that with my dad and my brother-in-law, which was super cool. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that five years ago, you know, or four years ago. So it was super awesome that um, I was in the spot with my health to be able to go do that. So. Well, congrats. So we're going to get more into your accomplishments and, and your transformation in a bit, but let's go back to Disulfram. So maybe Ethan, if you don't mind weighing in on this, because Disulfram, our, our first exposure to it was Brooke Stoddard, who is one of the founders of Generation Lime, who we love, Rich and I. He did it and it was transformational for him, right? He was really, really sick. He credits Disulfram to getting him where he is today in remission. And now he's giving back to the community, working full time and doing really well. But we've had other people tell us that it's caused, you know, extreme neuropathy that almost never, you know, has, has not gone away for them. And, and they regret it, frankly, right? So we've heard both sides of the coin when it comes to disulfiram. So where did you guys land on this? And Ethan, if you don't mind starting first, I know Josh, you did it as well. I, uh, I definitely had a more negative experience with disulfiram. Um, I, I started out really small dose uh, and right away was so tired all the time. Um, no matter what I did just from taking such a small dose and with disulfiram, like you need to be up at higher doses for it to really take, um, more of an effect. And I, I could never work up to, to, uh, a high enough dose where it actually would be effective, effective. Um, and I just, yeah, I, it, it made, it made my depression worse. It made my fatigue worse. Uh, and it, it just wasn't worth the symptoms for me. And there were, there were better ways to treat that I had, that I had done before that I would, I'd prefer to do. Um, but I know for some people that it works so well. Uh, but for me, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the right, wasn't the right med. Yeah. How about you, Josh? Yeah. So disulfiram for me was also not super lovely, um, increased fatigue significantly. And we were roommates at the time that I was taking and he was taking it too. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was not lovely for either of us. Um, and so we really tried to push through it for a couple months, but ended up just going a different route with treatment there. Um, just because it is, it is very challenging for those listening it. Yeah. Disulfiram is awesome for some people and it's a home run. 
and it is really effective, but for others, it can really amplify your symptoms to the point that you're like, can I, you know, stick through this treatment protocol? Yeah. And we've heard the psychological side effects as well can be devastating. So if you're already struggling with psychological impacts of Lyme, may not be the best idea if, if they get amplified on disulfiram. So I really think it's it's a personal decision and it has to be evaluated for each, each individual. So I kind of want to put this into context. So Ethan, you were, you were, you got sick when you were, when you were 16, approximately, you were diagnosed when you were 20. How old are you today? And were you able to get through school? Just kind of give us an idea of, of the, the time frame from when you were diagnosed, all the treatments you did, where you're at today, and were you able to get through school? Because you said you had to kind of take a break a little bit, right? Yeah, well, I, I did graduate last April. Um, so I, I got my bachelor's degree. Thank you. That was huge for me. Um, because yeah, school was school was a struggle. It, it took me a while to get through. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm turning 25 this year. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it took me a while. I, I guess I started when I was 18 and then finished when I was 24. Um, and so, yeah, almost, almost six years, little break in between when I started my treatment, but it, so it took me a while to get my degree. Um, but yeah, it was a huge accomplishment for me. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the time frame around yeah. it. Ethan, was there anything else? I know you said it was a little foggy, the treatment, because you were so sick and you trusted your dad. Thank God for your dad to help you. Anything else noteworthy treatment-wise that you can share with our community, people that are sick and looking to kind of follow in, in your successes here? Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I did after after I did pretty like heavy treatments, I, I did uh, some ketamine-assisted therapy, and that was that was really helpful for me. Um, I, I did, I think once a week for five or six weeks, I can't remember exactly. Um, but, but with the therapist right there by me, um, a, a doing it all. And that was very beneficial for me. Um, so if that's, I don't know, that's something that I know people look into. Uh, yeah, I have to say our, our first podcast guest that we've ever had literally number one, who is a good friend of Rich that we did in person in his law firm and in, in his conference room and that we, we, we did in the back in, in person before COVID. She did ketamine before she had a, a Lyme diagnosis. And, you know, we've had a lot of people who have had success using ketamine. And I believe the thought process behind that is it almost resets the brain pathways that have been altered as a result of late stage, long-term chronic Lyme. And it, when it resets the brain, it helps your nervous system reset. It helps you think differently and really allows you to heal because you're in a calmer, you know, more rested state. Is that, is that your view on Ethan or yeah, do you have a different Yeah, take? that's pretty accurate. My, the, the therapist that I did it with, she, she gave me the analogy that it's like, your brain is like a, a hill that is covered in snow and people have been sledding down it. And that's your thought process is that those sled trails that are just carving out the snow and your brain will continue to fire in that direction. And if, if someone's going sledding down, they're going to go that way um, because those trails have been so embedded into the hill. Um, and then with, with the ketamine coming in, it's like a fresh sheet of snow, fresh sheet of snow. Um, and it, and it's like, yeah, it's like a blank slate that just kind of helps all those neural pathways, um, just refresh. So it really helped you with your psychological symptoms and overall you felt really helped you rebound. And that was more of something you did, you think that helped get you out of that, that's that loop state or that, that altered state because of Lyme, right? Yeah, absolutely. Anything else noteworthy that you want to share that was helpful for you or something that wasn't helpful and you want to caution or warn our listeners about? Um, if not totally cool, just want to make sure we, anything that's on mind that you don't, that you don't forget to uh, share with everybody. Yeah. I think one thing that wasn't helpful was, um, I went off of an antidepressant at one point while I was treating, um, as suggested by my doctor and quickly, quickly found out that that was not a good move, um, and went back on, uh, right away. Um, and so I, I just recommend with anything like that, just being very slow and being very cautious with, with psychological medicine. Definitely. So I'm going to pivot over to Josh before Rich picks it back up again. I have a few more questions for you, Josh. So I want to get you right. So you were, you were sick when you were 14, diagnosed 15, and I think you're 24 today, Josh. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. 
So what did you did you do anything else treatment wise that I may have missed? We talked about the oral antibiotics, the IV, IV antibiotics, all the IVs, the herbals, the gut stuff, the ozone that I sell for him. Uh, we, we we touched on ozone, but was was ozone helpful for you, Josh? Did you find that was an effective therapy? Yeah, ozone I feel like is awesome. Um, I feel like I don't think it's the end all be all for Lyme patients, but I definitely think it is complementary and can help. Um, and I would definitely feel better the days after I did that. Was it the IV ozone? Because we know there's different ways to administer ozone. Yeah, I did. I did IV ozone. Okay. And is there anything else, Josh, that you did that you want to share that was helpful that yeah, can benefit so, our listeners? So one of the one of the oral treatments that I did was the Dapsone protocol, um, which I'm sure listeners can find online. Um, the Dapsone protocol is very rigid on what you take, how many, and when for a certain amount of time. And I feel like I made a lot of progress when I did that for a couple months um, or however long it was. But I, I remember my parents even saying, like, I made a lot of progress when I was doing that specific protocol. And we know Dr. Harwich is a big fan of that. And we've had some people mention the double Dapsone protocol. We've had Jenny Batachi on who's done it. We've had Lorne Pfeiffer who did, I think, the quadruple Dapsone protocol, I believe she was saying. Uh-huh. So for you, but but those a lot of people who've done that, the, you know, that that high amount have said that it's been really rough. Like when they took it, the herxing was really rough, but it was worth it because in the end they got a huge turnaround with an improvement when it was done. Did you find yeah. that it was really rough for you as well, or or wasn't as bad in your case? Yeah, um, I mean, I still went to school, still lived my life, you know, still carried on. I'm sure there was a lot of days where I was more tired or you know, feeling symptoms, but you push through and, you know, you know, you do it and the chance that you'll feel for the chance that you'll feel better. So, yeah. So Josh, were you able to graduate? Tell us about, about your, you know, obviously you went to college with Ethan. He was able to get through, were you able to graduate? And if so, you know, what was that like for you to, to finally reach that goal after being so sick? Yeah. So, um, I graduated, um, in 2021. And I've just been working since, um, which has been awesome. Um, and then also one more treatment thing that I did do is I did do SOT therapy. Um, I I'm have, sorry, did you say SOT, Josh? That's what you said? Yep. yep. I have done SOT as well. Um, and I feel like that has helped keep things in, in check the last, you know, um, year or so. So I did that earlier last year. Was that with your same doctor or did you have to go to somebody yeah. else to get the SOT? Yeah, same doctor. So still, still pinged um, positive on a couple things, and so just wanted to keep those in check, and didn't didn't really want to do oral antibiotics or anything like that. And so was reading a lot about SOTs and people's experiences with that online, just on Facebook, and um, decided to go for it. And so did did a couple different strains of SOT. Do you think it was worthwhile for you the SOT? Looking back, are you happy that you did it? Uh, yeah, um, I think that it was helpful for sure. Okay. Any, anything else, Josh, that I missed with you in your treatments that was either helpful or something that you would not recommend that you did that didn't work out too well for you? Um, just being nice to yourself, cut yourself some slack and uh, definitely communicate more than you need to with your family and your employers and those around you um, to create a sense of understanding of what your situation is like and having a support from friends and family definitely makes a big difference in order to just get through. I had a friend in high school that knew what was going on with me and he knew I didn't want to miss the football games or the basketball games. And so he'd show up at my house, wake me up from my nap and say, let's go, you know, and he'd, he'd force me out of the house. So that, that was super awesome just to have that kind of support from people. Yeah. So Rich is going to pick it up from here, but I just want to say that for me, this podcast has been hugely inspirational so far, and we're going to keep going because it's something that shows you don't give up, right? And I think that's the biggest part here. Don't give up because you can feel better. You can get better. And if we give up, we're never going to have any hope. We're never going to, we're never going to have that opportunity to live out our lives to the fullest. And you both proved that out that it may have been difficult. You tried a wide variety of treatments, both Western, Eastern, alternative. And here you are, you graduated, you're working, you're feeling better, and you're keeping you're keeping on doing things to feel better. And that's what I think it's really all about is that persistence. So Rich, I'm sorry for jumping in again. I know that was not my place, but you're up. All right. So you you folks were um were fellowshipping in a in a traditional faith uh in the Mormon church. Uh so talk to us about what role each of you believed um your your um faith 
life played in helping you through the challenges you faced while you were on your Lyme disease journey? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's been a very big part of my journey. Um, and just finding my, my rock with Jesus Christ and, um, that support, uh, from, from the community and from the church was huge for me. Um, but yeah, mostly just like that, that God was there for me, that I wasn't alone. Um, because that, that was really hard. I, I, there were a lot of times where I felt so alone, um, and, and I felt like the only one who really understood was Jesus. And that, that was really what I relied on a lot. So Josh, give us, give us your perspective on, on how your faith uh, aided you on your journey. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, one, it made me think a lot, um, you know, why, why does this happen? Why is this happening to me? How, um, and how can I get through it, you know, um, and how can I put one foot in front of the other? And I feel like through lots of prayers um, and just even fasting as well, too, is a practice that we do. Um, you you gain inspiration and the ability to push forward as you, you know, put your faith in God. Um, and even if there's days that you feel like you can't put your faith in God, um, you just just pray and just try and ask others for help. And you can find angels all around you. Um, that will help you along the way is my personal belief. So Ethan, I'd like your reaction to um, something that I recently found in my study, which is uh, one, one of the personal development experts that I study argued that uh, everyone has faith. It's just how you apply it. You're either going to, you're going to believe that you're not going to get better or you're going to believe you're going to get better, right? But everyone has faith. And talk to me about how uh, your your faith in Jesus helped you to apply your faith in a positive way that allowed you to have the tools you needed to heal. Yeah, I, hmm, I think for so long, I just thought, why me? Why is this happening to me? What good could ever come from this? And in those moments, like those thoughts of just feeling alone and hopeless were really hard. But I think I had this idea in the back of my mind that, hey, this is going to this is going to help me someday. This is going to help me someday. And I don't know if I've quite. Well, well, let's pause there for a second, right? Because you, you, you had faith at that time, but you but you did not have faith that you could you would get better, right? That that this was going to work for you, that 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 God was working for you. You had you had applied faith negatively. And at some point you were able to pivot over from that and see that this was working for you. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And when you when when you made that pivot, that I'm sure played a vital role in your ability to heal. Yeah, it did. Like I I was more hopeful. Um and and I don't think I would have gotten to that place where I had the hope without all the treatments that I did. Like it's 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 combined with with God's support and doing the work that it takes to get better. Um, and and I uh, just lost my train of thought. Yeah. So, Sorry. but let, let's 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 build that out a little bit more, right? Because really, what it was was you were doing two types of work, right? You were you were you were on your you were on your journey of achievement where you were doing the work that needed to be done in order to aid your immune system in in fighting off these these uh, microbes and ultimately healing. But at the same time, that was working on you, and you were going through a spiritual transformation. And it wasn't until both of those paths came together that you were ultimately able to get to the mountaintop. I don't want to you know I don't want to step on Josh's toes with his uh, with his his literal physical journey up a mountaintop, right? But you were on, you were on a journey up a mountain yourself as well. And you were on both a, a journey of achievement and a journey of transformation. And it was when they came together that you finally got to the point where you could heal. Yeah. And, and I think that healing has come through helping others. Um, and that was a big part of, of this uh, fundraiser that we did is we, we want to help other people. 
um, other, other people are going through this and, and I know that they feel so alone, like I did. And, and that awareness that, Hey, you're, you're not alone. Um, that people are there for you, that God is there for you is so important in getting better. Um, you, you need support. And, and if people, if you're not religious, the support of people around you, um, just, just having, yeah, I guess a foundation to just rely on and, and fall back to where, where you have that support, I think is, is huge. And, and for me, I, I had that through, through Josh and his family and other, and my family and friends, um, and, and Josh's dad, when, when he helped me get diagnosed, just said, pay it forward. And, and that thought has, has given me a lot of, a lot of a sense of purpose in, in, in the reason why I had to go through that and that I could, that I could be a voice for good and help other people realize that there's hope. So Josh, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, um, uh, um, professors I study is, um, is, uh, is a professor uh, that teaches identity and she defines identity as finding your place in the world. And one of the things we've observed on this podcast is one of the virtues of going on a Lyme disease journey is you get sort of stripped of, of, of all of these sort of airs that, you know, get packed on us either through culture or education or, or society in general. And we become a more pure version of ourselves. We find our identity, we find our purpose to use Ethan's words. How was this journey helpful for you at a very young age to find your purpose and understand that God has made all of us to serve each other? Oh yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, it's been awesome. Um, I feel like I've had really incredible experiences in my life because of the challenges that I've had. Um, I feel like I've been able to test myself um, and really learn and try to ask good questions. And you have to be your own doctor at the end of the day too. You know, you know, you, you know your body best. Um, and it's, it's been super awesome just to, you know, develop such good friendship with Ethan and then also become closer with members of my family and those in the community that have dealt with this as well too. Um, and I think that Lyme disease is a disease that isolates people um, and it, it's really challenging. Um, it's really challenging to ask for help and to say, I'm not okay and ask for help and be willing to do that. And so encouraging other people to ask for help and encouraging them in the right direction, um, has been super awesome. And, um, I mean, it's just been great to, help other people in our community and friends that we hear of. And also once, once you have health issues, everybody that everybody knows about, then they start to tell you all of their health issues too. And so I think it just opens up a lot of conversations and especially being in Utah where Lyme is not like considered a Lyme, where it's not considered a Lyme endemic state. There is a ton of Lyme disease in Utah. Um, and we're seeing that every day with people that we know. Yep. Let's talk about this concept uh, of asking for help, right? Because it is very difficult for all of us to ask for help because the way we've all been made is to serve, not to be served, right? Not to serve ourselves, but to be served, right? But one of the best ways of, of getting help and being served is to, to just find a healthy community of people to be with, right? Find a community of people who are dealing with the challenges that you're dealing with, and you know what will happen? They will serve you. You don't even have to ask for the help. The help will come because that's the way people have been made. So talk to us. Uh, I'd like each of you to address this. Talk to us about how um, you've seen that you were made to serve, that everyone else has been made to serve. And all you do is have to make yourself available and the isolation will, will, will fade and you will find yourself in a place where you can serve other people and other people will serve you. Yeah, I... Uh... I think when, as soon as I was open about what I was going through with someone, um, that kind of opened the door for them to communicate with me what they were going through and, and it gave me an opportunity to serve and, and not, it, not even 
like in a physical way of service sometimes, but just like, Hey, I'm your friend. I'm here for you. Um, and, and that way of just being a support type of service. Um, yeah. So I think just being open and, and that opens the, like being open with your experience opens the doors for other people to share their experience and to connect and to serve each other. So talk to us, what I'd like to do is sort of now bring our podcast now to a close by bringing us back to where we began, right? This is full circle, right? And, and one of the things that the two of you have done is not only recognize you're supposed to be serving each other when you were roommates um, and not just serving the other people that you have one-on-one -on -one contact with, but now serving your community at large and serving the Lyme community at large by um, by having events like uh, the uh, the movie event that you um, had um, had hosted, and by raising money for organizations like LymeDisease.org so that they can um, go forward with their mission of both putting people generally uh, on notice of the challenges of Lyme and giving those people who are diagnosed with Lyme. Uh, some of the tools they may need to come up with an appropriate treatment plan with their uh, healthcare professionals. Yeah, um, definitely been a journey and been a good one. Um, it's been challenging and um, learned a lot along the way, but like at the end of the day, relationships are what is are most important in life and having meaningful relationships comes through service and um, just taking care of people and being willing to go out of your way to help somebody else um, without any intention of needing something back from them. Um, and I think Lyme gives you purpose in that sense to, okay, I don't want these other people to suffer. So I'm going to speak up, you know, um, I'm going to speak up. I'm going to, you know, speak the truth about my experience and what is actually going on in this community and how, the medical system in the United States has failed us as a society. Um, and it just takes individuals, you know, that are listening to this podcast to be, be the captain of your ship and speak up and, you know, push those in your community that are either struggling with Lyme like symptoms to go and get tested or building relationships um, with doctors so that you can, you can refer people um, to the right places that they can find, they can find care. So one of the things that folks on our podcast are aware of is that we generally ask the same question to each one of our podcast guests. And that traditionally had been, what would you do if somebody you love came into the room after the podcast and they had been bitten uh, by a tick? But I'm not going to ask you guys that question. We're actually going to, we're going to pivot to another question that we're going to start to ask all of our guests. And the new question we're going to ask is this, what if you met somebody in the Lyme community who was um, about to begin their journey and they were struggling financially, I would like each of you to give me three low cost or no cost treatment options that you would recommend in the event that someone new to the community were asking you for that kind of help. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question because it is difficult financially to get the, get the right treatment. Um, especially when the right doctors aren't covered by insurance and things like that. But I, I would personally very much recommend yoga. Um, just get your mind and your body in the right place. That's not necessarily killing the bacteria or, or anything like that, but, but it's certainly, it's certainly helping you to detox. Yeah. And it's certainly yeah, yeah. helping you, it's certainly helping you to calm your, your, your mind so that you can have, uh, so you can have the faith uh, and the focus you need to heal. So that's wonderful. So number one for you, Ethan, low cost and no cost would be yoga, which you could, you could get apps for or online, you can yoga. So give me, give me two more, Ethan. Yeah. I would also think um, what's, what's been really helpful for me at no cost has been just gratitude journaling. Um, just, just writing and dumping things that I'm grateful for, uh, helps keep my mind in the right place, especially when, when I'm low and, and things are hard. So gratitude is certainly a pro-social emotion and it's a good way to prime your brain so that you're, you're, you're more likely to have 
the parasympathetic expression of your nervous system would allow you to be thoughtful and to be focused on your treatment. That's wonderful. So thank you. Gratitude and journaling might be a third one uh, because you could be focusing on, on gratitude, but also journaling. And journaling is really important so you can see the progress you're making because what happens with Lyme disease is in many cases we are uh, we are making such little gain per day that we don't get to see all the gains we've made over some period of time. And in many cases, that is depressing because we don't think that we're getting better. And by having a record of, of these little gains that we've made um, is important to, to be able to reflect on. So you've given us three. Do you have one more, Ethan, since you've been so fantastic with the three you've already offered? Or should I <laughs> over the job? It's a tough question trying to think of, think of these on the fly. Um... Well, you, the three you've given are fantastic. So you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move over to Josh now because he's had some time to reflect on this while he's been <laughs> under the gun. Uh, this wasn't even on the folks, for folks who are listening to this. This was not on our questionnaire. I just gave it to these guys for the first yeah, time. Rich, no this is not fair. Show. We should ask this question on our questionnaire to not put people on the spot. <laughs> yes, we should. But <laughs> um, we have two very smart young men here, so they're they're thinking on their feet. So Josh, give me this. <laughs> well, to add to Ethan and what you said, um, I wish that I would have journaled more throughout my experience to see how I was feeling then versus now, because I feel like the biggest um, indicator that I was feeling better was like when I could go do more things, but two people were like, wow, like you look healthier. You're my parents were like, you seem like you're having more energy, you know, you're going and doing more activities. Uh, but if I were in the situation where I wanted a low cost or no cost thing, say you can only afford a hundred dollars a month of Lyme treatments, I would a, either research online and figure out what tick infections you have and what herbal medicines do the best job at killing those. You know, is it Japanese knotweed? Is it Artemisia? Um, is it berberine? Like what, what herbal medicines could you take? And like, could you get a pill bottle of those on Amazon for 30 to 50 bucks a month and just treat it that way slowly, but surely. And it's trying to keep your body in check that way. That's one thing I would suggest. Um, the second thing I would suggest is get yourself a infrared sauna blanket. Um, those things can last forever. All you have to do is make sure you keep it clean and wipe it down after you lay in that and sweat. Um, and infrared sauna can be really good for that. Um, you can find them on Amazon as well for, you know, a hundred to 200 bucks for an infrared sauna blanket. And it's and, and and sauna is sauna is a fantastic tool. I mean, one of the things that Matt and I are going to be doing in the near future because I recently bought a sauna and I've been doing research on sauna, but it's a a fantastic detox tool. And of course, when we're in a position where we're struggling to move, especially early on in the treatment journey, when you're when you have the type of challenges you both suggest you have with exercise, that a good alternative would be uh, would be a sauna. And infrared sauna is a great tool. For those people who do not have heat intolerance, now Matt had some heat intolerance, so that may not have worked for Matt, but it does work for many people on that. So that's a, a fantastic uh, one and two. So give me number three, Josh. Um, number three, I would say, yeah, I think the internet is one of your biggest resources that you can utilize and figure out um, low cost or no cost solutions from people and tips and tricks. Obviously there's a lot of misinformation out there, but I think there are a lot of really good communities online um, that give good and valuable information. LymeDisease.org being one of them, they write lots of good articles and have tons of resources there um, of, you know, different ways to treat the newest research that's being published and things like that. Um, and so that's where I would just educate yourself. Um, and read as much as you can about Lyme disease and co-infections and how to treat them. Yeah, and, and of course, for folks who are not capable of, um, of, of reading or, or, or having you know, issues with light sensitivity the way Matt was early on the journey, of course, we also have a resource like Tick Bootcamp. And our yeah. podcast, we have folks who can just listen to brilliant stories like those that Josh and Ethan were kind enough to share with us. And people can get shortcuts by listening to what you guys did on your journey to see if that speaks to them. So I can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your, your very powerful stories with the folks in our community. And thank you all for the work that you're doing uh, in serving this community in the ways that you have in the past. And we're really excited to see what you two really um, you know, smart young men are going to do for this community in the future. So thank you. Thanks. We thank you for having that. us.